Welcome. Thank you for watching this teaching video from Oak Tree Community Church in South Bend, Indiana. Please check out our other videos and don't forget to like and subscribe. Our mission is to help people come to know Jesus better and love Him more every day. We believe this will not only help our own spiritual growth, but also help us better influence the community and the world for Christ. For more information about Oak Tree, please visit us at oaktreechurch.com. There you'll find past message series, online giving options, and more information about our discipleship process that we call The Path. Now, enjoy this message. We'd love to hear from you in the comments or the website contact form. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Nick. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Gary Day. I'm an elder here at Oak Tree Community Church. And I'm usually not the guy up here, right, at this time. <laughs> so I will be referring to my notes an awful lot more than the other guy does. <laughs> uh, but there's also a big question on where is Daniel, right? Where in the world? Anybody remember where he went to? Yeah, the Philippines. So on Friday morning, um, I don't know what time, but Friday morning, he left. And 40 hours later, he got to the Philippines. Can you? <laughs> yeah, good for him, right? <laughs> uh, if you're like me, you may be a little unsure where the Philippines are exactly. So we got a couple pictures to put up. Uh, the first picture is the 50,000 foot view. You can see China, you can see um, uh, Japan, and then also Australia. The little Philippines is, you know, right there in the middle. And then if we move to the next one, um, uh, he's where the red dot is. <laughs> they're, they're in the Philippines. Um, and he flew into, I don't know if it's... Uh, uh, Manila or Manila uh, there, but that's what he flew into. And the Philippines are actually um, so much bigger than I ever knew. Uh, from that black dot down to the bottom of that red where he's at is an hour and a half for a car ride. And I'm not sure if he's going through a bunch of mountains or what the deal is. Um, also, the Philippines is made up of over 7,000 islands. It has a population of over 100 million people. So I, you know, I don't know what I thought it was, right? <laughs> but uh, certainly, certainly quite a bit bigger. So he is actually at the Word of Life Bible Institute in the Philippines. He's going to be teaching there for two weeks. This week's, I think he's going to be teaching on spiritual gifts. Is that right, Sarah Lynn? Do you remember? Yeah, I didn't pay attention either, right? <laughs> We're going with spiritual gifts. <laughs> uh, and it was, it was an offshoot of that, too. Um, since he just got there, and they're like 13 hours ahead of us, too, so he's, he needs to already be in bed. <laughs> uh, he'll let us know, I'm sure, and he'll be sending some pictures, and we'll, we'll show next week what he's up to uh, with, his, with his people. <clears throat> All right. Have you ever noticed, like, in your job or any field of study, that there's keywords that have a lot of meaning? Right, and people would use those keywords and just assume everybody knows what you're talking about. Right, so when you go into the doctor's office and you know, and you're sick, and they say, "Well, you have you know, include uh, or acute influenza," and you're like, "Oh," and then you realize, "Okay, I got the flu." Right, but to the doctor, it means something incredibly specific, and all these words kind of mean the, mean the same thing. All these big words, and I think every industry has it too. Uh, think about cooking and, and being a chef. There's a French word called mise en place. And uh, apologies for anybody that knows French. My, my high school French is failing me <laughs> uh, that I had. But um, it's, a, it's a term. And what you do is you don't turn the stove on yet. You take the recipe out and you get every ingredient out and you prep every ingredient. So if you need to have a diced onion, you get the onion out, you dice it up, you put it in a bowl. You get all the, all the spices out, put them in, you know, individual together. I don't know how it all works, right? Uh, but once you get everything together, now you can turn the stove on and start your cooking. Right, kind of a cool concept, mise en place, you know, with a with a huge meaning behind it. So, I think you know where we're going here, right? <laughs> so, for the past four weeks, we've been talking about a big word in religion called hermeneutics, 
right? How do you study the Bible? The process behind studying the Bible. And we took four weeks with that. What we want to do now is to put it into some practice. So that's what we're going to be doing for the next three weeks. Um, but uh, before, before we hit there, I want to bring up a verse that, that Daniel brought up at least the first week, and that is uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verses 16 and 17. And it says, Every scripture is inspired by God and useful for four things, useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the person dedicated to God may be capable and equipped for every good work. Now we put this up on the screen a lot and, and because we're talking about hermeneutics and we're talking about us, that verse 17 really got to me this time. That the person dedicated to God, that's us. If you are a Christian, you have made yourself dedicated to God. So that's us. And what's our goal here? Our goal is to be equipped for every good work, to be capable and equipped for every good work. And how do we do that? We've got to study the scriptures, right? So that's what we're doing here is we're, we're, we're going to be talking about not just studying the Bible, but a way to study the Bible uh, through an established process so we can get consistent results. So the idea is you could take two people, and if they're using the same hermeneutic, the same process to study the Bible, and you give them a set of verses, they should come up with the same answer. And if they don't, it's not a fight then on, you know, oh, I believe this, you believe that. It's going through where do they differ on their her hermeneutics. Yeah, kind of cool, isn't it? Being civil in a conversation and talking about religion. Yeah. And I, and I think all of us conceptually understand that, but we just need to see it put in practice. Right. So for the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at a different set of verses each week, and we're going to be applying our hermeneutics so you can see how it's intended to work. And there's a couple caveats here. Right. We are going to be limited on time. This is quite a can be quite a lengthy process. So we're not going to be able to get into every single option and we're not going to be able to get in very much depth either. But the intent is to provide you with a uh, exposure on at least three things that you would be able to take home and do by yourself. So that's kind of that's kind of cool. And then the best part, there's no test either, right? So that's that's kind of the cool part. And I and I get it, right? Most of us don't want to be a biblical scholar, but that's not what this is about. This is about just giving you uh, a means to do your own Bible study. Because without it, right, you're reading the Bible, oh, I don't understand what's going on, what do I do, where do I go? But if we give you some simple processes, you're able to take that farther. And you're able to figure things out on your own, which, um, uh, which can always be helpful. All right, so where do we start? So that's actually the questions that Hermeneutic tries to answer. So Daniel in his third week put up a slide that, um, that we saw a, a number of times, and there's a four-step process in here. And it spells out an acronym, and the acronym is ACTS, and each word, each guy starts with, uh, um, with, one of the, with one of the letters. So step one is to ask questions. And the idea is um, we just start asking a bunch of questions, right? And who are you going to ask these questions to? Well, you're really asking them of yourself. So you need to keep track of them. So you do need to write them down. It works, it works much better if you do write these down. Uh, if you want to use a computer, that's absolutely fine. If you want to use a tablet of paper, that's fine too. You may even consider drawing a line down the middle and have questions on one side so you can put the answers on the other side. You know, however you want to work, you'll figure it out, right? And, and you'll, you'll figure out what works best to you. Once you have all your questions asked, now the time is to go back and get some answers. Right? So we need a way to uh, get some of the answers for your questions. And as you're answering your questions, I think you literally need to be writing in the answer next to the question. And sometimes um, an answer will, uh, you know, you'll be able to answer three or four questions and you're like, woo! And sometimes you're like, well, now I just have more questions, right? And so you got to write more questions down. Uh, but that's the way this works. But at some point, you're going to be composing your thoughts. And you're gonna, you're in your own head are gonna be figuring out. Here's how I see 
what this, what this set of verses is about. And once you make that stand, and once you figure that piece out, now it's time to test it. So there'll be a couple ways that you can test it. One is uh, rereading the verses again, uh, but with your, with your composed thoughts in mind. And then another way is using something called, um, oh, totally lost me, <laughs> um, um, you know, going in and reading other people's words on, on what they've done, a, a commentary. And then at the end, if we've put all this work in, if we have decided that we want to do this Bible study on this set of verses, and we've asked the questions, we've spent the time digging for answers, and we've come to a conclusion, this is what God wants me to do, or here's what I'm reading in these verses, and, we're ch and we check with other people, and they're like, yeah, I'm on track. Shouldn't we apply these verses to our lives? Shouldn't we submit to the Word? Right? So that'll be the last step. That we, that we go here. So what we're going to do is we're going to hit step one hard today, and we're going to get into a little bit of steps two and three. Next week, we'll have a different set of verses. Uh, we'll hit step uh, one again uh, a little quicker, and we'll spend most of our time on steps two and three. And then guess what? All right, the third week, we're going to have another set of verses. Uh, we'll hit steps one, two, and three uh, kind of quick, and we'll spend most of our time into, into uh, step four, submitting to the Word. So that's the way, that's the way we're going to do it. Um, kind of the nice thing with this is we're going to be doing the ask question uh, three times, and that's uh, generally the part that takes the longest, right? And, and so, so we'll be focusing on it multiple times. So that, that part's kind of good. Um, all right, so step one, ask questions. Uh, since Daniel's not here, I'm going to modify it already, right? <laughs> I can do that. Oh, you know, it's late in the Philippines. He's not up. You know, I'm, I can see him like furiously typing right now. <laughs> uh, but here's the deal. Um, I'm going to add a step zero in here. And the reason I'm going to add a step zero is it was something that I wasn't doing. Yeah, so go ahead and flip over. Ooh, right? Yeah, how earth-shattering is that? But here's the deal. I, I mean, it, it's so fundamental that it's absurd, and it also really ruins the acronym. <laughs> but I also wasn't doing it, right? I wasn't reading the Scripture. Um, so early on, I'd, I'd go to a Bible study. We had, you know, a set of verses to read. I'd read those verses, and I really had no idea what was going on, right? So th I would then go over to a commentary, and I'd go, oh. <gasps> Man, that makes so much sense. And then I'd go to Bible study and I'd be able to answer all the questions, right? Because I read because I read the commentary. Um, and what I realized was uh, I knew the answers for a day, but they never really clicked with me. So one day I'm reading a commentary, um, and I was actually reading the foreword of a commentary. That's how much I was reading commentaries, right? Because <laughs> nobody reads the foreword. Uh, and the foreword said... At some point, you actually have to read the Bible. And man, it really hit me hard, and, it, and it's really true. And so what we need to do is we need to make sure that we are taking the time, we're reading the Bible, we're studying the Bible, and we're using commentaries, which are awesome, but not as our primary <laughs> source of biblical truth, okay? All right, um, and, and it's true. I don't think you can get better at understanding the Bible until you're in it for yourself and doing it for yourself. And I, and I think this way works in the world all the time. I, I think our English teachers were exactly right when they said the same thing. Um, I don't know about you, but when I was in English in high school, uh, we had to do book reports all the time, right? So you, so you read a book and then you wrote a report and you couldn't use the internet. Right? I know kids, ah, oh, because we didn't have the internet <laughs> right back then. <laughs> Otherwise, we certainly would have used it. But that doesn't mean we couldn't cheat, right? Do you guys remember the Reader's Digest versions of the books? Um, what's that? Cliff Notes, right. They still have those? Yeah? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but here's the deal with Cliff Notes. I see those as being commentaries. Right, and and the idea is, uh, it it'll tell you uh, the major points of the story, the major things that are going on, and can certainly help you, um, you know, uh, supplement if you've read the book. But 
I certainly know people, not me, right? It wasn't me. Uh, but people who didn't read the book, read the cliff notes, was able to write their paper and get an excellent score on it. And they had no clue what the book was about, right? They're just parroting words. And, uh, and I see a big parallel between that and commentaries. Now, commentaries are great. Um, if, you, if you don't know, our pastor has written um, uh, two out of three commentaries that he's going to have. <laughs> uh, the first one, this one happens to be a New Testament commentary. And he did something that's called a chapter-by-chapter chapter review. So for each chapter, he has a section in his book. Um, I think he had to do it to get his master's degree. And he had to write like a quarter page for every chapter that's in the Bible. Of course, he wrote a half to a full page on each one, right? Uh, then he's gone back through it. Sarah Lynn is, is helping him all over the place with that. And it was good enough that uh, he went ahead and got it published. He also has an Old Testament one, uh, but this is only half of the Old Testament. So later, I think this year, not to put any pressure on him, uh, I know that he's actively working on it. He'll be coming out with uh, the sister to the Old Testament one. Um, which is kind of good because Haggai isn't actually in this version. <laughs> um, and just to let you know, there's about 1,200 chapters in the Bible, right? So, uh, he, and he's going to have about 1,200 pages when he, when he ends up too. All right, so commentaries are great, but for their, for their specific use. So today we're going to be in the book of Haggai. Um, and we're going to be in chapter 2, and we're going to be in verses 1 through 9. These are the verses that we're going to be um, um, studying and doing our hermeneutics on. So I'm going to go ahead and read those, and then we'll start with step 1, which is ask questions. So Haggai 2. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the Lord's message came through the prophet Haggai again. Ask the following questions to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel. Governor of Judah, the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the remnant of the people. Who among you survivors saw the former splendor of this temple? How does it look to you now? Isn't it nothing by comparison? Even so, even though, wow, even so, take heart, Zerubbabel, decrees the Lord. Take heart, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and take heart, all you citizens of the land, decrees the Lord, and begin to work for I am with you, decrees the Lord of heaven's armies. Do not fear, because I made a promise to your ancestors when they left Egypt, and my spirit even now testifies to you. Moreover, this is what the Lord of the heaven's armies has said. In just a little while, I will once again shake the sky and the earth, the sea and the dry ground. I will also shake up all the nations, and they will offer their treasures. Then I will fill this temple with glory. So the Lord of the heavenly armies has said, The silver and gold will be mine, decrees the Lord of the heaven's armies. The future splendor of this temple will be greater than that of the former times, the Lord of the heaven's armies has declared. And in this place, I will give peace, decrees the Lord of heaven's armies. Okay, so just from this reading, right? We read it. We did step zero. Now we do step one, which is ask questions. What are some questions you have about these verses? What's that? Who is, Haggai? who is Haggai, right? So the whole who, what, when, where, why, right? So those are, those are valid questions. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say we have to write those down because we'll see we'll, 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 where we will get into the background here in, in, uh, in uh, today even with that. Yeah, exactly. What happened to the temple, right? 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 It's being rebuilt, right? So if it's going to be rebuilt, that means it was built at one point in time. Something happened to knock it down because it's not there anymore. And now, now it's being weighted to being rebuilt. So what's the story there? What's going on? Very good. That's a great question. All right. So you guys kind of see how this works, right? Yeah, who are the people that they're speaking to? Uh, a number of those are named in there, right? So we know like there's a high priest, we know there's a governor in there, and then but there's one name in there, Lord of the Heavens Armies. Who's that? That sounds important. <laughs> uh, and why why is the head of the army involved? 
you know, in, in Haggai. So questions like that, right? Those are the exact kind of things that we should, that you should write down. Uh, the, another question in there, God says, um, um, what is he, something along the lines of uh, begin, you know, you guys need to begin to work. Well, what have you been doing? <laughs> right? <laughs> what's, what's been happening? And what's the work? <laughs> Right, so those are those are the type of things that that you should write down. Uh, you know, I'm not a teacher. You know, I'm sure a teacher would say you need to write down at least a half page or a full page of questions. You need to write down the questions that seem to be important to you. And there certainly are going to be more questions that are going to be added added to this list. But that's a good start for that. Um, so if we go, if yeah, so. Um, Asking questions, write them down, and then as part of the step one of the ask process, there's a number of things you can do to generate more questions. I do think that you ought to start with two, and uh, those are listed up there. So we're going to go through we're going to go through both of these. Uh, the first one is verify the text and translation. Um, so if you think about it, what we're reading in our Bible is not the original text. Right, and the original text for Haggai was written in Hebrew. I don't know how to read Hebrew. Um, I'm assuming most of you don't know how to read Hebrew, so we need to read an English version, which means somebody had to translate it from Hebrew into English. And in fact, there's whole teams of people that do this, and there's many different translations out there. Some are awesome. Some are not so awesome. Uh, but generally what happens is this team of people get together and they discuss why, why do we want to do a new translation? What do we want to focus on? You know, do we want to make it easier to read? Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, do we want to make sure that we want to translate every word exactly the way it was written word for word? Okay, um, but that's also going to lead to, that sounds like the best way, but it's also going to lead to some problems because a lot of times there's concepts in there versus individual words that make sense. And then this group of people um, write a Bible in English. And at some point in time, there's going to be a word in Hebrew that doesn't have an exact English equivalent. And they're going to have to pick and choose and decide on a word to put in there in that place. Right? And let's say this group does that. Now this group's over here, and they're writing their own Bible. And they're, they're, they're going through their paces, and they come to that same word. And they choose a different word to translate it as. Okay? Now here we are um, reading both of these in... Um, you know, in the in the different in the different translations, and we come across and we notice that there's a different word in there. It's not necessarily our job to say which one is right, but it's going to be our job to understand both of these words. These group of people thought this word was right. So, how does both of those words fit into what I think the scripture is about? Yeah, so it's kind of it's kind of weird. So to do this, uh, the first thing you need to do is we need to pick four translations. And I would say that most of us have a Bible that we are very familiar with and we're used to reading, and we'll just call that your base Bible. So now you need to pick three other translations. Um, you can pick any ones you want to. I would suggest that you stay away from the message just because the message is intentionally so different and is trying to be readable. Uh, but every word in there is going to be different than other translations, so you're you're going to have uh, you're going to have too many words, and you're going to get frustrated. Um, so once you pick those translations, what you do is you have your base Bible open, you read verse one, you have your second copy open, whether it's um, you know, and generally I use the net for that. So let's say it's King James. You have the King James open. You read verse one. Now you're going word for word, looking for differences, and then you're noting those differences down. See why this is going to take a while. <laughs> now we're not going to we're not going to be able to do that here. Uh, then once you're done with verse one, you can either do the other translations or you can go all the way through King James. Uh, you know it doesn't matter. But at the end, you're going to be going through every verse um, uh, a minimum of three times. 
right? Looking at things. Um, so, in the interest of time, I've picked out uh, I've picked out a verse, and we're going to put up verse two up. And uh, I swear we are. It's, there we go. Um, and what I did, uh, what we did for this week is I went ahead and just put in red the differences. So this is the net translation of Haggai 2.2. 2, and uh, the other Bibles I used were the NASB, the NIV, and King James. And oddly enough, where uh, Haggai starts out with, ask the following, these other versions said, speak now to. Right? So you got speak now to and ask the following. Is it different? Yeah. Okay, so you note it down. Is it materially different? I, we don't know yet, right? Because we haven't done this very much. So you go ahead and write it down. Um, as you do this a couple of times, you'll get a better feel for what's important and what's not important. Um, that one's probably not the most important thing on the list there. Uh, the second difference is the name of Jehozadak in there. Two of the versions use Jehozadak, two, and the other two use a different name uh, for a total of three different names in there. So we have three names to name the same person. Is that important? Sure seems important, right? So you write it down, and at this point, we're just trying to ask questions. So that would certainly be a question. You know, why, why, are these, why is this different here? And then the last one in this verse is uh, remnant. Um, three of the um, translations use, a, use the word remnant. Now, when I think of the word remnant, I think of carpet. I don't, I don't know about you guys, right? Because <laughs> you, you're having a room carpeted. Uh, they, they, they bring in the roll, and they start cutting pieces out, right? So they can lay, lay the carpet in the room. And those pieces they cut out, those are commonly called the remnants. Um, and when I think of those, I think of those as leftovers, right? Or, or you know, the, the unused pieces. So can you use remnants? Yeah, of course, they work great in the closets. Uh, you can use them, you know, in, in your workroom or in a mudroom. Um, yeah, they definitely have a use, but they don't seem to be the primary, right? They seem to be the, they seem to be the secondary. Um, now, if we think about that word remnant in terms of the nation of Israel, we find out that, or we're going to find out that a group of people um, were in Israel and they've been removed, and now they're coming back. A remnant is coming back. So kind of cool. And if we um, check out all the Old Testament people and the New Testament when they use the word remnant, it's always about the nation of Israel, a subset of people, but those people are always true believers too. And again, right now we're just asking, we're doing the question piece, but uh, we, you know we got to keep this thing moving too. And then the the um, King James uses the word residue instead of remnant. Now, when I think of residue, I, I think of leftover, but I also think there's really no use for the residue, right? Because uh, you know I go to washing dishes, right? You plug up the sink, put water in, put soap in, wash the dishes, pull the plug. And there's a residue right <laughs> around the sink, and you scrub it off, and it goes down the drain. So, so it's kind of a cool thing here. We're talking about people coming back, and what's better to use, remnant or residue? And again, it's not for us to decide which one's better. It's for us to understand that the Hebrew word was difficult to translate, and one group translated it as a remnant, and the other as as a um, sorry residue. Yeah. All right. Got one more to look at in verse six. So in verse six of Haggai chapter two, uh, he's going through a list, and um, he uses uh, uh, the net uses the word sky in there. You know, sky, earth, sea, and dry ground. The other three versions use the word heavens. There's a big difference between heavens and sky, right? So which one's, which one's right? And three other versions used it, right? So, you know, it's three against one. You know, is, is the net wrong? 
And why wouldn't it have used heavens? So um, it's hard to see on the slides, uh, but there was actually a, a number that was a superscript on it, which meant that there was a net note on it. So the translators actually put a note in saying why they translated the word this way. And if we flip to the next slide, um, we, can see, we can see what they said. Um, I think that TN is for translator notes. And what they're saying is, you know, or heaven. So they're acknowledging right off the bat, hey, a lot of other um, 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 Bibles or translations are using the word heavens. And in fact, this word can either mean heavens or skies. And then they go on to say, we pick sky and here's our reason. Kind of a cool thing, right? Now, this early in our process, um, we are, we are, um, we shouldn't be reading these kinds of notes, you know, in, in, if we're pure in here, uh, we should be asking questions. So in reality, we would write our questions, sky or heaven, which one's right here and move on. But I wanted to point it out because uh, there are an awful lot of translation notes that show up in the various Bibles. So it's an easy place to get that type of information. And then later, um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on on how you can get answers, but this is one of the ways that you can you can get your your answers on here. Okay, so at this point, we would have read Haggai chapter 2, verses 1 through 9 a couple times, and then we've gone through it at least three times while we were going through the other translations. So we probably have a pretty good feel for what the words say on the page. We also have a list of questions that we've written down, and we probably also have a list of translation differences that we wanna, that we wanna keep checking out. So our, our list of questions is, is growing here. And the next step that, that we have on here is uh, understanding the background and the context. Okay, so we're going to focus on the context first. And it's really how do our set of verses fit into the overall book? So in this case, we're talking about Haggai. We're in chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. So we should probably read chapter 1 so we could figure out what's going on. That's the chapter before. And we should probably also read the rest of chapter 2 to figure out what's going on. And if we do that, we'll have actually read the whole book of Haggai. Haggai is a very small book. <laughs> um, so we end up reading the whole book of Haggai. Um, and if we do that, we would understand some things. Um, we see that our, our chapters, and, and I'm really looking at my notes here for this, uh, that our chapter, chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, they fit in very, very nicely with the rest of the book. And we also see that chapters 1 and 2 are primarily about the temple. And they're listing, they're talking about the temple all over the place. And we also see that our section, or that, our section started with, you know, on the first day of the sixth month, blah, 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 blah. Haggai starts out that way too. Haggai um, chapter one, verse one starts out, uh, starts off on the first day of the sixth month of King Darius's second year. Now, to me, that's another question. Wow, what date is that? You know, where are we at? Where are we at in time here? And we see that sections in Haggai are marked by this is what the Lord says. If you remember, our verses had that in, in there too. This is what the Lord says, or write down what the Lord says. So by that, we know that Haggai is a prophet, if we didn't know that before. A prophet receives the word of God and then is responsible to get that out to uh, the, rest of the, the rest of Israel. Um, we also see, like I said, that our section is about the future glory of the temple, and when we look at the book as a whole, it's about, um, the whole book is about the temple. And uh, as, as Tina said, we learned that the new temple hasn't been rebuilt yet. So there was a temple before, it got knocked down. Now something's going on where this new temple hasn't been rebuilt yet. And that's the piece that we got to figure out. 
So it's time to um, you know do more questions, and we increase our we increase our list of questions there. But at least we get the context in there. Now, now we need to move on to the next step, which is the background. And uh, and Rachel, this is where your question gets answered: uh, the who is Haggai, who, what, where, when, and why. So um, all along, especially if you're here listening to Daniel during this series, is commentaries are bad, don't read the commentaries, right? And you're like, oh, <laughs> okay. now I'm telling you, it's okay to read the commentary. <laughs> uh, what you want to do to get the background, because we've got to get the background from someplace. So you either need to ask somebody or you need to read about it. And if you're going to do this on your own, that means you, that means you need to read about it. So where do you go? You go to the commentaries. Um, everybody that writes a commentary, even a chapter by chapter commentary at the beginning of a new book will spend some time talking about here's what's going on in this book. You know, here's the who, here's the when, here's the why, giving you information. And that's absolutely fine because you need this context and background information to be able to answer, answer some of your questions. And if we read that, here's what we learn. We learned that Haggai is one of the easiest books to date, right? And every commentary I've ever seen always makes a big deal about it, right? Because on the first day of the sixth month of King Darius's reign, or of King Darius's second year, that's actually August 29th, 520 BC. Now, how cool is that, right? We're in 2023 that add on another 500 years Almost 2,600 years ago, there was a guy sitting at a table with a pen and paper. I don't, I don't even know if it was paper, right? Pipers, maybe? <laughs> and I don't even know if he had a pen, right? Something that he was dipping in ink someplace, and he was writing something down in August. And in fact, on August 29th, 2,600 years ago. I was kind of hoping today would have been August 29th, right? That would have been, that'd have been kind of cool. And then, you know, of course, for me, my next question is, well, I wonder if it was in the morning or in the evening when he was writing this. <laughs> uh, but those are the kind of things that, as you study it, it piques your interest, right? And, and the stuff that you start to care about. And then it helps fund you to, uh, to look for more things in there. Okay, so we know exact dates when this thing was written. And in fact, I think there's, I think there's uh, three, if not four dates in Haggai as he's moving through as different things are happening with regards to the temple. So the next question that's answered is where does Haggai take place? And Haggai actually takes place in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem, I don't believe, is ever mentioned in Haggai. So you got to put on your little Sherlock Holmes hat and do some sleuthing. And you realize the high priest is there. Well, the high priest is going to be in the capital city. Uh, the governor is there, uh, again, going to be in the capital city. And at one point, they're actually looking out, looking at uh, the foundation for the temple, which is also in Jerusalem too. So there's some there's some clues there that we know that we're in Jerusalem. And then what's going on? So this is uh, this is a big part, but it's also um, critical to understand, you know, why Haggai was there, what was being written, and what was the background. So about seventy years before the events in Haggai took place. A king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came into Jerusalem and wiped out Jerusalem. Right? Went into the temple, took everything of value out of it, then they took every stone down from the temple. Right? No stone left on top of each other. There were walls around Jerusalem. Walls were the same thing happened to those walls. Every house was gone into and ravaged. Um, people, I'm sure some people uh, weren't in Jerusalem at the time <laughs> and stayed out. Maybe some people fled, um, doubtful. Um, I think the majority were killed. But some people were taken hostage and were taken back to Babylon. And they were integrated into the Babylon society. Um, as the nation of Israel, they did, they did do their best to stay separate. Um, but, uh, but that's where they were living. Over the years, Persia became the powerhouse and Persia defeated Babylon. This group of people then moved to Persia. 
at some point, a king by the name of Cyrus of Persia decided that we don't want to have these people anymore here. <laughs> I actually think he was trying to build up a better tax base. So he said, hey, how about you guys go back to Israel? And in fact, I'll fund your trip. So he gave them items that they still had uh, from King Solomon's temple, which is the first temple. They gave them some money, and they gave them some things to build with too. People went from Persia to Jerusalem in three phases. In the first phase, there was about 50,000 people that returned. So we're talking that they were in captivity for 70 years before this happened. Um, 60, 60 some, because now, now the people are back in Israel, or the first, the first wave is, and we're about 12 years before Haggai is written. And the first thing they do is they rebuild the altar. Second thing they do is they start rebuilding the temple, and they get the foundation done, and then they stop. And they start building up their own houses. And then somewhere along the line, they go, hey, we need some walls, <laughs> too. So they start working on the walls to refortify the city. And now, the, now Haggai comes in, and God is telling Haggai, guys, you've been back 17 years. When are you going to get to my house? Right? And if we think about it, the nation of Israel, God was living in the first temple. God was so mad with them that he had them taken into captivity for 70 years. Now this group of people is back, and God's like, they're going to pay attention to me this time. And for 17 years, they really haven't paid attention to him yet. <laughs> so he's saying things like, why do you think your crops are so poor? Why do you think you guys are still lacking for everything? Build my house. And that's what the story, that's what the story of Haggai is all about. And if we take that and we look at some of our verses again through those new lenses, we see things so much clearer too. So if we take a look again at verse two, or uh, chapter two, verse three, it says, who among you survivors saw the former splendor of this temple? How does it look to you now? Isn't it nothing by comparison? Right? I think what happened is at least some of the people that came back had actually physically seen the temple in the first place. Now, if you think of somebody, a five-year-old kid being able to see that temple, he's gone for 70 years, he's 75 years old. Even if somebody's 10, they would be 80 years old. Not a lot, but some people would come back and say, yeah, it's nothing. Plus, they're not even looking at a temple at this point, right? They're only looking at the foundation of where the, where the temple was. So the, um, there is some sarcasm in there too. Um, also, the first temple um, I'd said was built by Solomon. Solomon was the richest guy in the world. He had all the money. He had all the builders. Um, he also had um, the uh, framework for what the temple needed to be looked like from his father, David, who uh, God told him what to build. So he had the blueprints. He had everything, right? And this was a gorgeous temple where people were coming in from the world just to see this temple. So now it's knocked down. Now during Haggai's day, they're going to build this temple back up and they take about five years to do it. There's no way that splendor of the second temple is going to be anything close to that first temple. Right? Right? So... Now what we're doing, um, let's see, sarcastic. Um, so now we need to take a look at some verses again. So if we take a step back, uh, we have uh, nine verses that we're looking at in Haggai. I think when we read verses one through five, everybody will come to a similar conclusion for what's going on in those verses. So I think we need to take a look at six through nine again. Um, so we're going to put, the, put these up on the screen again. Um, I just want to read them a little bit to you. Uh, I'll read through them while he puts them up on the screen. Uh, Moreover, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies has said. In just a little while, I will once again shake up the sky, the earth, the sea, and the dry ground. I will also shake up all the nations, and they will offer their treasures. And I will fill this temple with glory. So the Lord of heaven's armies has said. 
The silver and gold will be mine, decrees the Lord of the heaven's armies. The future splendor of this temple will be greater than that of former times, the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. And in this place, I will give peace, decrees the Lord of heaven's armies. So the questions that I have is, again, in verse 6, 7, 8, and two times in 9, Lord of heaven's armies, who, what's going on here? He talks about shake-up in two places. Shake-up doesn't sound good, right? I'm sure there's a word for earthquake. He intentionally didn't use earthquake. So what's shake-up mean in there? And then we're talking about future and former temple. I don't know what's going on there, right? What's going on there? And then the last... I will give you peace. That sounds good. When's that going to happen? Right? But all of these are future events that are going on. So we do need to take a look at those in a different light. And, and there's one more, um, um, not trick that I want to use, but um, we need to discuss uh, the third topic, which is called the literary form. So, for all scripture that we have can fall into one of four basic forms. Um, the first one is something called historical narrative. And this would be scripture that, um, that pushes the story forward and also that provides additional information. So Haggai in these verses definitely is historical narrative because it pushes the story forward. Now, we also find that there's a couple other books that cover very similar topics when, um, when, when the remnant comes back to Israel. We see Ezra and Zechariah that are written right around the same time. But where Haggai is different is he's focusing on the temple in there. Poetic literature is another one. Um, we see poems, right, in, in uh, Scripture. We also see songs that are in Scripture. And a lot of times you're reading Scripture and, you know, you're going through reading it, reading it. And then all of a sudden there's like these short verses and you're like, what, what's going on here? Well, this would be, it is, it's either moving into a song or a poem or something. And of course, the Hebrew to English translation, none of it's going to rhyme, <laughs> you know, type, type of deal. Uh, but that's generally what's going on there. And you need to look at those verses through a different light, understanding that, hey, this is a poem or a song. It's going to be conveying a different type of meaning to us. Uh, the third thing is an epistle or a letter. We find that a lot in the New Testament and primarily in the New Testament where somebody is writing a letter to somebody else. So you just need to view that scripture a little bit different. In that, you're generally going to see an opening, who the letter's to, uh, and then the problems or whatever it's trying to address, and then some kind of closing, right? Because it's a letter, and that's the way at least people used to write letters. I don't think anybody writes any letters anymore. <laughs> And then uh, the last form is prophecy. Now, we know prophecy can take a couple different um, looks to it. Uh, the first with prophecy is prophecy is anything God says to man. That's prophecy. All of Haggai is prophecy. Um, I think there's one verse in Haggai that doesn't include God, that does not include God in it. And that's all. So, so he is all over the place in there. Uh, now, the prophecy that we usually think about would be end-time prophecies or things that happen in the future. And that's what these verses 4 through, four through um, I'm sorry, that's what these verses 6 through 9 are all about. Um, if we go back through, did we already go? We already went through those verses, right? Um, did we go through the ones in red? Okay, so if you can throw those back up uh, with the ones in red. Sorry, we had a little, uh, had, to, had to get with him uh, talking about this. So when you see red in here, these, these are future tense. And go ahead and just, just keep going to the end because I already read it, right? I will do this. They will do this. The future splendor, I will give. It's all over. It's all over in there. And these are things that are going to happen sometime, right, uh, in what we call the end times. So one way to think about this is just because something's in the future doesn't mean it's end times. At the time of Haggai, it was something that was going to happen in the future. That was 2,600 years ago. Has it happened yet? So 
the nations. Have the nations offered up their treasures yet to, Jeru to Israel? I haven't seen that happen yet. So that's a future. They also talk about the future splendor of the temple will be greater than that of former times. Has that happened yet? No, we don't even have a temple. I mean, we always talk about the third temple that's going to be built. So the first temple was Solomon's temple. It got knocked down by Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and then Haggai, Haggai's time built the second temple. That temple stood until AD, um, AD 70 when Rome knocked it down. And that's about uh, uh, 60 years after Jesus, Jesus died. Since then, there's not been a third temple. Now, tomorrow, Israel could build another temple. That would be the third temple, but it may not be this temple, right? Because they could do a temple that could get knocked down. They could build another 10 temples. What we're looking for is a temple that's going to be built whose splendor surpasses that of Solomon's temple. Now, we don't know exactly what Solomon's temple looked like. We, we got a list of his building materials, though, and how much money they spent. And uh, it certainly uh, seems like it was glorious. And uh, so we're waiting for a temple to be built there. We're also waiting for the nations to offer up their treasures. And when that happens, that temple may be the one that is going to be the one that goes into our end times. Which is kind of a which is kind of a cool concept, and then the last thing in here with verse nine, and in this place I will give peace. Has that happened yet? I don't think Jerusalem's ever really been at peace, right? But the understanding is, and when we try to put all the pieces together, we see that God is going to shake up the nations. More than likely, it'll be a true earthquake, and it'll also be a shakeup in the governments. A temple will be rebuilt, be funded by the nations. This temple will be absolutely gorgeous. The splendor will be there. Jesus Christ will come down. He will be our Messiah. He will bring the glory and the peace. And just like in the past, where God lived in the temple, God is going to live in the temple again. How cool is that? And he'll be ruling from Jerusalem. So what we just did is a quick overview of step two. And step two is compose your thoughts. You know, we kind of went through, we answered all the questions. And then when you take some scripture and you believe you have the answer, you write your own commentary for it. Here's what I think the scripture said, or here's the way I would word the scripture. And that's step two. Step three is test. So one of the things that we would then do is go back and reread the scripture with what I just said. Does everything fit in place? Uh, and we'll talk about that more. We'll talk about that more next week. So like I said, I went really quick over the steps two and three. We'll cover it again more next week. So some ending thoughts as we wrap up for today. Um, is this hermeneutics going to take some time? Yeah. Yeah. But is this something you can do? Yeah, you guys can do this. <laughs> you can figure it out. You can get your ways through it. And again, the advantage of doing it yourself is not only you're self-sufficient, but you take what you learn and you can apply it to the rest of the Bible too. And it certainly does get easier over time.